evening, everyone. Thanks very much for listening to this uh, webinar. I'm delighted that we've got Simon London, who's going to give his thoughts about uh, an aspect of leadership. Simon's uh, a national leader in education. He's head teacher of Hall Mead Secondary School in Havering. It's an outstanding school. It's a teaching school. He's been there for about eight years. Since September, he's taken on a CEO of Empower Learning Academy Trust, which is a, a number of schools um, in the Havering area. So I'm really pleased that he's here tonight. So he's going to do a short presentation, and then I've prepared some questions to ask him, which hopefully will keep you interested. So Simon, over to you. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Simon London, head teacher at Hallmead School, and uh, from the 1st of September, CEO of our new uh, learning, Empower Learning Academy Trust. Thank you ever so much for taking time out of your probably very, very busy evenings uh, to, to listen in this evening. Hopefully, um, the presentation is quite brief, but might stimulate some thinking about uh, current agenda, which is very much around the formation and creation of multi-academy trusts and uh, stepping into the to the realm of academy sponsorship. Uh, then, you know, I'm happy to answer a few questions. I know Jeff's got some uh, lined up, and then uh, open to, to, to colleagues uh, sending in whatever uh, they feel they would like to ask uh, and give my, my opinions on that. So, thank you for listening. Um, yeah, so the presentation really um, is about some of the um, early challenges, lessons, um, tips, do's and don'ts really about making the shift from uh, becoming a, a head teacher of one uh, standalone institution to, to then broadening out into taking on uh, a wider remit. As it stands for me personally, as well as being the new CEO, I'm still also the day-to-day -day head teacher of my school, Hallmead School. Um, and although we've expanded our senior leadership team uh, and, and our enhancing capacity behind me, in these early days, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still wearing the two hats uh, and will do for the foreseeable future um, because our mat is a very new one and we're still finding our way, etc. So, um, basically, what, what I've done here is a kind of subset of a presentation I delivered at a, a Capita conference fairly recently. Um, and I've taken one strand away so to make it a little bit smaller and a little bit more snappy. Uh, so I'm just focusing on the bullet point there about what it really is like uh, when you uh, broaden out from um, uh, one um, uh, successful um, but very distinct organisation to take on responsibility for some more. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what, who's in our mat and what that involves. Um, but first thing to say really is, you know, this is very new territory for this, so, so far from being any form of expert, this is very much a kind of learning as we go. Uh, obviously, we've been drawing upon uh, lessons from elsewhere and advice and guidance from elsewhere. But one thing that's really struck me straight away about being the CEO of a new MAT and a new sponsor is really about how little there is out there on, on some of the ins and outs of, of what it looks like, what, what you do and don't do, and how much you do have to plough your own furrow. Uh, that said, there's a lot of work going on at the moment with the regional schools commissioners to try and address that and to try and share best practice. And obviously, you've got these huge megalith organisations at the moment that are really long-standing, highly successful, very widespread uh, uh, multi-academy trust sponsors. And then you've got organisations like our own that are very small. We are local-based and we're just kind of branching out in, in a local network. So, you know, to try and put a slightly light-hearted spin on it, what I think in terms of the process of becoming a sponsor, forming a map, I think there's four kind of stages to this game. Uh, the first being dating, the second being the mating, the third is the product of that mating, the spawning, and then you've got to actually get on and, and rear your, your new creation. So I'm going to take a slide on each of those, which will kind of, um, I think, take, take you through the process. We're kind of at the bridge now from the spawning to the rearing stage, uh, having started our map proper from the 1st of September. Um, so a bit of background on the schools. You can, you can read that for yourselves. Um, that's our track record. The other two academies are both currently requires improvement. Um, they're, they're, they're on fairly different journeys. One's on a journey upwards, having been in a category not that long ago and is now putting in lots of building blocks in terms of uh, pushing forward and is very much on, a, on an upward uh, trajectory. The other perhaps is, is not so and is uh, kind of at risk of, of slipping in a, in a backward trajectory. So they're on different journeys. Um, they were schools that we had 
ties and, and connections with already, and they do follow what's known as the, the lunchtime rule, i.e. You know, we can get to each of the respective academies uh, during a lunch hour. It takes about 15, 20 minutes, maximum half an hour uh, to, get to, those, uh, to get to those schools. Um, those are our objectives. Again, I'm sure you can read those for yourselves, uh, and when we, when we put in our bid to become an academy sponsor, we um, you know, had to have a, a long thought uh, in line with our, what was then our governing body and our existing trust board about what it was we wanted to actually do. Um, part of this was recognising that as a national support school and a teaching school and myself as an LE, we needed to kind of have some more meaningful impact in terms of our school improvement work. And you know, one of the problems with school improvement uh, is it's often done on a kind of gentleman's agreement. Obviously, when you when you form a mat and there's a sponsorship element involved, those ties are much deeper, the accountability is much stronger, but the commitment has to be there on both parties. Um, obviously, trying to do this against the backdrop of, you know, funding challenges has been part of something we had to we wanted to acknowledge was there. Um, but our prime mover really is to is to is to take a professional development model, use the work that we've done in within our teaching school. Uh, to kind of take that to another level now by deepening our commitment to develop together, collaborate on, on models for developing effective teaching, growing leaders, uh, and including our support staff in that that are going to be so critical uh, in developing a, a kind of centralised back office function that as yet we don't have, but we're beginning to see what that would look like. So at the dating stage, uh, you know, why did we you know, come out of our comfort zone and uh, think about moving beyond uh, the teaching school and the outstanding school and all of the other things that we were doing because we've always been very outward facing. Um, was really first and foremost there was definite pressure there. So uh, you know, regional schools commissioners now have a very strong and active role, uh, and we were approached uh, on a number of occasions to say that you know we ought to be thinking about. Uh, working with some local uh, schools or uh, putting ourselves forward as a sponsor because the view was that we had the capacity, we ought to be contributing to the school-led system, we were doing that already as a teaching school, myself as an LE, and uh, you know, there's a definite pressure. And there's a, there's a certain sort of wooing, so there's a flattery and there's a kind of um, uh, ease of transition that makes you think uh, this is the right way to go and then certainly once you, you, you enter that realm the accountability comes flying in very very well, uh, very very quickly. For us we, th we thought it was really important that any school we did work with was aligned in uh, terms of ethos because we put ethos first and we want our schools to retain their own personal ethos but they want that to connect and ours is very much a, a family ethos and that's an overused uh, cliche probably in many schools but for us our, our, our mantra is family for life and we want that to kind of be replicated so that was the, the seed of terms of identifying schools we could work with um, we wanted to have a history of school to school support and in both those academies we worked with one we'd certainly done some minor school to school support work and it was burgeoning but on the other one we had some long standing school to school support work which we'd seen made a difference and benefited ourselves and we thought that would take us uh, would be a logical partner to, 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 to hook up with. Um, capacity was a big consideration and for us it's been unusual because we've taken two on at once which probably you know was an interesting challenge uh, and came about because there were two parallel agendas. Sort of, one we were already in dialogue with one school but the other was very much being promoted by the Regional Schools Commissioner. So you know that has brought challenges undoubtedly um, and uh, for me personally ensuring that I give each school equal um, support and, and challenge and, and have a, a mutual, you know, a, a similar relationship with both head teachers and on the governance front it is definitely challenging to do at once. So another consideration of course for everybody is can we actually make a difference uh, and you don't know that till you're in there and there are numerous unforeseen barriers and obstacles that challenge that question but nevertheless for, you know, in terms of identifying the schools we thought we could uh, pursue in our, as a sponsor we certainly wanted to feel that we could do something there and, and we needed therefore to know about them and to have undertaken the appropriate due diligence. The other big question around dating and it's always the one that comes up in the kind of beauty parade of schools uh, approaching uh, uh, mats and uh, sponsors approaching schools that are in there and that is the, the, how much top slice do you take you know you know we didn't really perhaps know how much we would need in terms of funding things at the centre because we didn't really fully understand 
what the demands were and certainly yes we, we, we took a very light touched approach to that a quite small percentage because you know in both cases the schools like ourselves had financial constraints to consider but soon realized that we needed to in, increase that you know the, the map doesn't keep anything at the center in terms of carry forward or, or slush fund but it does you know as the school improvement needs are identified the need to expend on that is very very becomes very very clear and paramount uh, and consequently we need to make the the kind of alignment of staffing and the benchmarking etc of, of costs uh, go down uh, so then once the sort of relationship began to form uh, then it kind of reflects inwards really and the challenge was to then really think okay we've, we've done this but what is it what does our trust stand for what is its culture um, is it simply a replication of what's gone on on a one school level how do we get to identify that we're now responsible for three times as many children with three diff three times as many outcomes um, and, but retain what we thought that was all uh, uh, the purpose of what we wanted to achieve um, identifying really in the CEO role what then the sort of commensurate leadership structure would be and I think very early on you know it became really clear that it had to be hierarchical and I'm lucky in that the head teachers that we work with were, were fully um, on board with that because really if, if there's an attempt to, to rotate leadership or have a flat structure things that need to be done won't necessarily get done in a timely fashion uh, and you know ultimately although it's very rare you know if we do need to say look the bottom line is you're going to have to do this even if it's uncomfortable you need a structure to enable that um, and luckily we've been very very lucky in ours but you know there's the odd sticking point um, stakeholder views because people misunderstand what a mat is and you know the people back at base in the, the sponsoring school get very jittery is it going to you know take us down a route are we going to be diluted is it going to increase our workload parents have misconceptions and misunderstandings the pupils don't necessarily understand you know some people think it's going to be radically different because of the models where everything changes over now other people you know they're not looking for that and you know they're, they're, so it's really important to to kind of encompass those at that at this stage questions come at you that you wouldn't have thought of you know like simple things like you know um, what are we going to do about the headed paper through to you know really complex and challenging system questions around you know uh, do we need a safeguarding link who's responsible for the single central record etc etc so you know you can definitely anticipate for having questions you wouldn't have anticipated the due diligence is a challenging process because I tend to think really in many ways once you're on the conveyor belt and the regional schools commissioner is, is leaning upon you to to go down this route then identifying the issues yes but you know pulling out of the deal or you know, becomes very challenging and certainly you know I think there's a lot of work to be done nationally about what due diligence looks like and good models and examples of that that's a challenging thing that you need support with and I'm not really sure we 100% knew exactly what we were looking for and then of course the unforeseen consequences and one of the schools not directly linked to our work at all one of the head teachers unfortunately went off ill and has, um, uh, unfortunately we need, needed to uh, sort of address that with an interim head teacher the governing body began to fragment and we had to put in an interim transition board that is now another set of meetings that I have to attend because that board is trying to accelerate the pace of change so there are those things that then consequently relate to the capacity that you won't know now until you, you get in on the ground at the spawning stage, so rearing, uh, sort of developing, which is kind of where we're at now, it's then realizing the structures that you have and haven't got as the map begins to take shape and questions begin to be asked, determining what systems need to be aligned, how they're put together, um, and what we need them for. You know, do we want to centralize everything, some of it? If we're not centralizing, can we control it? Do we need to control it? Do we want to control it? Where do the policies and procedures sit? That's almost an overnight question because, you know, we've all got our policies and procedures and lots of us had ones that were model related to Havering and sort of historic but suddenly there are quirks, differences, subtleties in terms of TLRs for example in the pay policy and whether or not there's accelerated progression that need to then be very quickly identified and cemented and that's a big piece of work along with the scheme of delegation. Establishing the ground rules, you know, how we're going to operate the frequency of meetings I got quickly to having my mat Wednesday when I go in on a Wednesday on a certain parameter set of meetings and a certain kind of uh, protocol but uh, all the time we're identifying the need for new meeting forums, new protocols and new kind of ground rules. 
I've mentioned the scheme of delegation. It's a big, big piece of work. And although they're model ones, it's only when you go through page after page you begin to understand the permutations of that and the transference or not of power to the respective school governing bodies. And the holding on and letting go, you know, accepting and recognizing that you're going to be in your own school less, you're going to have less direct control, you, your email traffic is going to increase because people know you're not in and they're sending you something they think you need to be aware of, etc. But you then empowering your staff that are backup based to make more decisions, to grow as leaders and, and, and to develop their uh, leadership styles. Um, quick thing there, I'm not going to read this about the kind of format of what the trust then looks like in terms of its base structure. Um, and so ultimately when you get down to the local governance committees, replacing the local governing bodies in our model, they're primarily responsible for those educational standards along with their behaviour and safety. But everything else is being taken up into the, into the mat in order to enable that prime focus. That is a real decluttering task for the two RI academies, but for my own governors that was really challenging. They were very active, supportive governors, a large governing body. They've had to kind of accept reducing down to 10, losing some power in this model in order to enable the mat. So, you know, those things are, are again another consequence. That's what it looks like in graphical form at the moment, and the numbers in brackets are the numbers of people on the respective uh, boards, uh, and that is skills driven. So there's a skills audit on all of those levels. Um, gaps in the skills audit is identified and um, respective people with those skills are sourced. It wasn't like that to begin with. Obviously the trust board contained a lot of people that were governors from my school, but very quickly, whilst many of those have stayed, we're beginning to see where we need particular skills addressed. Uh, that's kind of uh, the committee structure. I've taken out the names of the chairs and the members you can see who goes along to the respective committees and what we've done is we've we didn't foresee this but we've got rid of all local governing committees and we've now got committees at the board level uh, and we've very much copied the, the reach 2 model all their stuff is open source they're a very large successful um, academy sponsor and they have a policy of open sourcing their materials on their website and we've adopted a similar framework uh, perhaps with the newest committee being the risk uh, which becomes really, really important on a, on a mat level. Uh, so finally, the, the rearing stage where we're heading now is to think about how we grow the role of the CEO, how we build in succession planning uh, and the executive group at the moment that consists of myself, the other two head teachers and a school a academy effectiveness advisor who works across the three. Again, we didn't envisage that role but uh, we had the opportunity to recruit a, a, a former deputy head teacher uh, from a, a, another school in Essex who um, I'd worked with in the past uh, who was looking for some part-time work and lived very near to all three schools and she was too good an opportunity to, to pass up but also we really realised that for me to be able to confidently know there's someone on the ground making a difference um, it was imperative to have someone with a kind of hands-on approach. So uh, that's a role we didn't foresee. We then had to charge out and we've developed but it's very successful. We're devising common reporting formats and cycles so I can very quickly report on our KPIs rather than the sort of thing you might see at governing uh, body level. It's got to be something that is a dashboard type approach but giving us the information we need. And we've come up with some quite interesting ideas on that because there's not many things out there so much. Um, appointing a finance director, so someone who's got sort of an overarching role, um, they're, 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 they need to be high level uh, qualification, that can be an expensive and well paid role, and using software, we've had to replace our software system so we can actually um, have a, a software package that looks across at the finances in the map. Developing the HR function and the whole educational services team, uh, and the first thing we've really done is look at our contracts and benchmarking because it's amazing the differences in things we've been paying and we're very similar sized academies, the differences we've been paying for things like grounds maintenance, uh, cleaning contracts, so very very quickly some really obvious uh, disparities and savings have come to the fore and we've probably put our initial work uh, in terms of uh, finance uh, cost cutting into that area uh, but we're now moving much more into that central function. So that's the presentation. Hopefully that's a bit of a race through, but it gives you an idea of some of the uh, challenges that we, uh, you might face if you are going to try on the CEO role or indeed if 
your head teacher is going to do that and you are back at uh, the base organisation seeking to maintain standards and push things forward in, in, in this new world of Progress 8 and funding formers, etc, etc. So um, I think now it's handing over to Jeff and then yep. at the end of the thing we can take some questions on the presentation or the further questions. So Simon, you sound as though you're really, in, you're really enjoying this. Can I just ask you what you know what you really enjoy the most about being the CEO? Um, well, being a CEO, enjoyment. I'm not sure is the right word. I mean, I always like challenges. I think you know it's really depressing actually that a lot of people are bailing out of headship and they're talking about. Um, you know, not recommending to colleagues that they go for it, and there's a lot of deputies I know who are anxious about, you know, taking the plunge into headship because of the, the football manager syndrome, where you could be, uh, you know, you're only as good as your last set of results, and that is a constant sort of shadow on the shoulder. But, uh, you know, it sounds cliché, but I think you, it is the excitement about making a difference. It is the 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 challenge of testing yourself in in a new arena. Uh, and I think that does really has caused me to reflect on some things that I thought um, were straightforward and are not. And actually, the networking side of it, I think all of the time, you know, headship is a lonely job, but actually, the more peer networks you devise and develop, the more rewarding they are, the more people are very open. Although it's a competitive world, they're very open to sharing and, and, and um, uh, advising. And, you know, in a map, you get that really magnified. You know, we struck up a great rapport. Uh, as a group of uh, heads and senior leaders, and it's, it certainly helped us coming back to reflect on what we do and don't do in the dialogues and conversations we've had with, with our colleagues in the other schools. So, so the main positives of being a head, do you want to just pull out two or three? The main positives of being a head, to me, I think it's, it's definitely feeling that you have the ability to make a difference to the young people in your school or schools, and although that brings with it quite a level of fear and uh, accountability, at the same time, you know, it's it's that knowledge that you you can shape that in a in a way that you've always believed is right and proper, and that you you, you know is going to, to make a difference. I think also it is the variety of the role. So I think at the time, you know, some of the things that hit you on a daily basis come out of absolutely nowhere and you know the MPQH is great but they're not in the MPQH, they're things you couldn't and never foresee and if I think of the things that I've encountered in, in eight years and there's a new thing every 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 day, every week that you can't look up anywhere but when you come through those and you always do, uh, you, know, you can reach a low ebb when you're looking back and actually laughing about them, sharing them with a fellow head or a partner just makes you really kind of I think grow as a person when you look back and think you know um, coming through that was incredible. Yeah. There are things that teachers do, pupils do, that you couldn't script. Uh, but when you resolve those, address those and come through those, you know, you do you do feel that you've enhanced your school and you've grown as a person. Right. And what do you think are the major concerns and any ideas about tackling those, Simon? Uh, what do you mean? The tech, what do you think the major concern, the issues that are sort of current? I think in terms of being ahead, what, what concerns you most and how might you tackle it, do you think? Yeah, I think there's a lot of major concerns that I don't think anyone listening in will be shocked about uh, and there's no kind of order to put them in because they're all inextricably linked. Um, I think the, 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 the kind of, you know, I've got... I, you get used to the accountability frameworks and they constantly change and it's very easy to, to offstep bash and DFE bash but I've never known a spell like it as it currently is in terms of the, the literal moving of the goalposts almost on a kind of monthly basis. The, the, when a new system is brought in it's then impossible to navigate because of the new uh, so for example if the current Progress 8 world you know I'm asking the heads of English to predict uh, who's going to get a five in the new GCSC? They can tell me a number, but neither they nor I categorically know. And you know, it's impossible to be aiming for a target that is a moving target. Um, so I think that's a massive factor. Recruitment and retention, huge, and it's our job to to kind of grow that next pipeline of teachers, to inspire them, to develop our leaders, to empower them. And I think a lot of that is about making people responsible as well as accountable. Accountability has gone through the roof. But have we given them responsibility? You can only be accountable for something if you're responsible for something. 
the the ever present shadow, uh, your sort of grim reaper at the door, is the finance and the funding, and that's where you need fantastic business managers. But I think where some of us have been immune from the real pain of that, this year it's going to bite, uh, and, and and going forward it's going to bite even harder, and that does really really worry me. Um, and the, I think the special needs scene is a massive world of real challenge at the moment. Provision within the LAs is withering. Uh, complexity of need is, is, is growing. Um, children that would have been in special schools are now in mainstream schools because children that may not have survived some of the conditions that they have when they're, they're born now um, are now in the special schools. So, so you know, there's a huge challenge there and, and getting staff to be able to meet those children's need at the, to at the same time as stretch and challenge their most able. That's very, very difficult, very, very difficult, and I think there's a there's a maelstrom. You know, it really is a perfect storm at the moment. Okay, that's great. Um, I'm going to change topics now. Just wonder what you think about all the discussion about grammar schools coming back, Simon. Yeah, uh, it's an interesting one, um, and I do think there's been some probably headlines extracted from the uh, proposals that we talk about without having actually read the full proposals. Uh, but I've got personal experience having a failed 11 plus myself when I was a kid, lived in, a, in an area where you, you know, it was automatic, everyone did the 11 plus at primary school. I can remember failing that and I remember being, it was a body blow and then a the year later my brother who was in the year above, he passed. So that further rubbed salt in the wound. So I, you know, I went to a standard comprehensive and he went to the, to a very prestigious grammar school. So, um, you know, I understand where that's come. I, I do think that, you know, it's not a good thing. Uh, I think it's been ill thought through because I think it's based on evidence that appears to be evidence that isn't, you know, there are some phenomenal, highly successful, brilliant grammar schools out there and, you know, we, I've sent my staff to visit them to look at the way they stretch and challenge the most able, but to simply look at progress data, performance data and think, oh, that is because they go to grammar school, it's too blunt an instrument because we know that the brightest children make faster, better progress in whatever school they're in. But to offset that, I think the real challenge, and I think this applies in my own school as much as everybody else's, is if we're going to challenge this grammar school proposal, then we've got to be able to demonstrate that we are stretching and challenging the brightest children in our school, and that is hard. Yeah. And it's very, very difficult to get, um, you know, a stereotypical upper band boy who gets to a B, um, and he's happy with that because it's better than a C, and it's get his mum off his case to get into an A or an A star you know, uh, is a challenge. Uh, and in a grammar school, you know, he might well do that because he's in the flow of the traffic that's all going that way. In a, in a, in a genuine comprehension, we've got to be able to, to enable the same thing. So I think that does present the challenge, but I think that the, the, the kind of crudeness of the blunt instrument to, 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 for this to be the opening gambit of the, of the new government is, is wrong. Uh, I also think that actually, um, if you look at the small print, very few will get off the ground because, you know, for them to be able to sign up to develop a non-grammar school as part of a mat or to demonstrate an impact school improvement, that's going to put a lot of grammar schools off. Uh, yeah. And I think it will be driven by areas where there are known shortages um, rather than, you know, some huge widespread national domino effect of grammars popping up in the front and centre. Yeah. I want to say a word about all these new examinations that the children are sitting and whether you feel teachers are prepared for those, is there a good strategy in place for those? Yeah, I mean, we don't have a sixth form here, so I don't feel qualified to talk about A-level changes, but um, I think with GCSE, um, we've put a huge, a huge challenge to our teachers and to the children, um, and I think, you know, with the comparable outcomes agenda where we're trying to kind of um, massage, or massage or manage results so that they don't take a huge downturn or upturn um, does mean that it disables us from being able to have a set of tangible criteria that we can apply to enable pupils to progress at the moment in English and maths but beyond that you know, into, into, the, into the future GCSEs as they come on stream. I think the other thing is the, our inability to predict progress eight at a time when we're being asked for the pupils to make maximum progress is really problematic 
Um, and you know, to have a hybrid model where we've got one system working alongside the other and trying to say, are we going to do okay this summer or not, creates a huge amount of paranoia. Pressure that, if you're not careful, can come from the top down onto the middle leaders, in turn onto the teachers, in turn onto the pupils. Parents are confused, you know, and uh, you know, post-16 providers are they going to let people in with a four in English, a five in it? You know, what's going to happen there? So, I think there's a real lack of joining up the dots, a real lack of foresight into how we can find a, a way of accurately knowing that we're on the right journey, um, and then you know, the, the actual end product, the outcomes, are further muddied by the fact that this new academic regime with the bars being set higher is clouded by this still few games that are in the system where schools might enter an entire cohort for the ECDL, the European Computer Driving Licence, that pumps up their, their Progress 8 to the outside eye, looks like they're doing so much better than everybody else, but in reality is you know, uh, you know, a less valid qualification that will um, kind of manipulate the, the, the outcomes despite the fact that many people will say it's justified for the students pathway you know it's a, it's a you know it's not a level playing field uh, and I think that uh, makes it a challenge. equally you know in terms of rewarding for outcomes you know there's more you get 1.5 points progress for turning a B to an A you only get one for turning uh, an F to an E uh, you know is that right and proper uh, and does that allow all schools to be able to demonstrate the impact they have, regardless on the type of youngsters that they've got in their schools? Mm. Um, you're a national leader in education, and your schools are support schools. Um, how do you think schools can help other schools to improve Simon? Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, I think it's got to be about commitment. I think when, sometimes as a teaching school, when we've brokered support from one school to another, you know, because it doesn't all come from us by any means, um, it's fallen down because on one side, and it can sometimes just as easily be the receiving school as, as to the giving school, there's a lack of commitment to make it happen. There's, you know, excuses of, oh, well, I couldn't make this meeting or, you know, that's too inconvenient. And it fizzles out. Uh, and I think, you know, one thing that the MAP world does is it doesn't allow that to fizzle out because there's direct rounds of life's responsibility. So I think commitment is critical and it's got to be an enshrined commitment. I think that any sharing of best practice has got to be validated best practice because there's a lot of things that are, you know, masquerade as best practice but are not grounded in evidence and you know, obviously the work of the Sutton Trust, etc., is really pushing that and, and, and rightly so. Um, joint practice development, I think, is really the answer. So, you know, going in, if, if you know, we're going to help you adopt our new scheme of work because, you know, you've got no sort of concrete program study in your science department, for example, then let's jointly replan it, let's evaluate the units together, let's not just throw in a McDonald's model of this worked in our school, it will in yours, you know, it's a one size fits all, let's, let's get some ownership in there by co-collaborating, which the new examinations do allow to do, you know, this is a good time to be collaborating with other schools because we're all trying to solve the same conundrums. I think it's got to be non-threatening. Uh, and I think there's got to be no mixed agendas, you know, there's no use trying to, you know, some schools attempt to broker school to school support, but off the record they want it as a vehicle to um, uh, bring a capability forward to the member of staff. That muddies the water. If, you, if, if, if you're wanted in there to do some coaching because you actually want to develop the person, then I think that's got to be the sole agenda. When there's multiple agendas, it doesn't work. That's a, that's a management issue. The support issue is a support issue. Okay, thank you. Um, and finally from me, um, in terms of, um, I'm just thinking that the government sort of changed its um, assertion about all schools becoming academies, but for people who are listening who are not in an academy or in a mat, uh, what sort of advice have you got for those people? Would you advise them to become academies? Uh, well, what I would say is that may be the stated headline because that part of the uh, legislation was dropped but any DFE or regional schools commission event you go to, it's the, it's the only game in town. Um, and you know, I think really it's it's because the because of the implosion of the local authorities uh, and the way they've just been allowed to wither on the vine and the central removal of funding um, means that really you know the only way schools are going to be supported is by supporting one another. And the only way to do that with a kind of rigidity and uh, responsibility that actually works is in a map. 
Um, obviously, there's two ways of looking at going to the map. One is as their kind of sponsor, where you know you've got the angst about taking on extra things that might uh, weaken your uh, institution at the base. Entering the map, you've got the problem about ceding power, losing authority, losing identity, and that big question. But you know, on the balance of where we're at, I think it's the right thing to do for most schools, if I'm honest. And I think you know. I think it's better to try and be the driver of your own destiny and be pursuing maps that work for you in terms of ethos and culture rather than wait until you get this tap on the shoulder and the steamrollers outside the gates uh, and you've really been into it that you've got a preferred partner that you don't have much say in and uh, you know there could be different agendas. So you know I, I think there's a big case to join maps. I think it does strengthen commitment, I think it does broaden perspectives. Um, but I think it's got to be the right map for you, uh, and I think that's critical. Yeah, we've got two questions on on the screen. Um, one is saying that you mentioned an academy chain that's got open source open source resources. Who was that again, please? Uh, that was Reach Two. Um, I think if you just Google it, it will come up there. I think at the moment they only do primary, but they're very highly regarded. I think they were in one of the the recent Ofsted report. Yeah, they definitely were about the most successful. Um, academy chains uh, in terms of outcomes um, and um, they have a real ethical policy of everything that they do, all their framework structures etc, they have open source on their website. They also from what I understand, um, and I've never been to one, they occasionally do um, open source events which you can go into one of their academies and they will share with you any materials etc they've got not to uh, not to induct you into their trust but to simply say you know this is what we're doing and think is quite a good tool. Somebody else asks do you see a future for the EBAC? I yeah that's a good question I think I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon um, I think possibly for that to happen we may need a change of, uh, of political hue perhaps not that that's a stated policy anywhere but you know it might be my impression and you know, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. I, I wonder whether there will be a broadening. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of argument for religious studies, for example, to come in as a humanity. Um, we've seen data that's showing a, a decline, although it's a minor one, but a decline in arts take up and, and music. So whether it will have a broader definition, I think that's possible. But um, I. From what I've seen and picked up, it's definitely staying there as an attainment measure. It's obviously um, also kind of bedded into the progress measure, and with this new methodology, etc., I think there'll be you know sufficient time for that to bay down. Interestingly, I don't think that Ofsted ever refer to it. Um, I think it's the DfE that will refer to it. So Ofsted will talk about a broad and balanced curriculum of which the EBAC is part, but I think they will expect people to be doing the right courses for them. And if there are people being put on a conveyor belt to failure because they're being forced to do one particular subject over another, you know, I think that would raise a different question about leadership itself. Yeah. Can I just finally say it's been really good working with you, Simon, and your team, because with Best Practice Network, we're doing a, a leadership program. Anybody listening who lives near uh, Simon's school, it's on solid quality and diversity, it's school based, um, it's a program called Evolve. And I don't know your views about it, Simon. Yeah, no, thanks. Yeah, I would say that uh, we hadn't worked with the Best Practice Network before uh, this particular bid, uh, and Jeff's help in putting the bid together was fantastic. And uh, best of all, it was successful. So we're really excited about this program. It's again, I'm talking about growing leaders for the future. It's about you know uh, advocating um, a diversification of the leadership force. Certainly in Havering, when you look around the table of secondary heads, we're 90% uh, white males between 40 and 50. Uh, it isn't a great advertisement for you know all the potential leadership uh, candidates that are out there. So you know it's exciting working, enjoying working with Jeff and his team. And that's the first time I've ever done a webinar, and I've been very impressed how smoothly this has gone. You've done it really well, Simon, so thanks very much indeed, and thanks for listening, people. I'll hand back to Tim. Tim, just a reminder that our next session will be on the 1st of December, and it'll be Andy Hodgkinson, uh, another head, and we're really looking forward to hearing him. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming this evening. We wish you a very good evening, 
and uh, and thank you again to Simon for taking the time to speak with us this evening. Good night, everybody. <laughs>